Hello and welcome to part two of my narrated notes on the GI tract. This one's going to be looking at the ends and it's just going to supplement the, um, the plenary that Siobhan gave you. So let's get started. So I guess in uh, part one really what I went through were the different types of bugs that you find, where you find them. I didn't really go into any more details apart from that. So in this I want to kind of go through just a bit more about exactly what these commensals that are living inside of us are actually doing for us. Now they're generally considered to be a good thing. Some people consider them actually part of the innate immune system and they help in a number of ways. So let's start by drawing a picture here. And so we've got our cells at the bottom, epithelial cells at the bottom, and then we've got our mucosal barrier on top. And we're going to colonise it first of all with a range of different cells over the top. Now the first thing to say simply is that they just simply compete for space with pathogens. So when pathogens arrive into your gut through uh, drinking contaminated water or eating contaminated food, they find it very difficult to actually find space, to find a habitat to grow within, because these guys are already present growing away in the first place. Now the second thing is that these commensals, they're not just sat there passively, they are able to fight back as well. And when they fight back, they use essentially antimicrobial peptides and antibiotics to, to kill off competitors coming into the area. The third thing is that they will... Um, it's less important from a kind of an immune point of view, but what they, they will do is they'll be digesting the same food that you're eating, and in many cases they'll be digesting it into products, uh, that is metabolic products, that we can't make. Um, some in the literature which you'll read about are called short-chain fatty acids, and these are metabolites which will be made in this part of our gut, and they'll actually cross through the epithelial barrier and enter the bloodstream. There's also some evidence to emerge whether that, that's emerging that says that drugs that we take which we absorb by the body can actually be um, metabolized and in particular drugs like paracetamol can be affected by um, by the microbes living inside of us and then lastly again kind of, kind of going back to that um, immune um, aspect they actually do stimulate the production of this mucosal barrier in the first place they also stimulate the production of these defenses so these antimicrobial peptides in the first place there's loads of stuff in the research about um, the gut microbiome and it's probably worth saying straight away that you should be slightly cautious of some of it which where the, there's quite a lot of pseudoscience and a bit of quackery out there about um, the role that these things have but there's compelling evidence to now say that they have for, for example and I've just cherry picked a few examples here that they um, affect our ability to store fat um, this is quite an exciting paper in the uh, in journal called PNES and this was the role that um, these short chain fatty acids we've just talked about, actually their role in inducing or regulating blood pressure in mice. And it's very interesting to think that um, maybe the things that are living inside of us may be having other effects on our behavior as well. Now linked to your case, um, one aspect which is very interesting to look at is the what's called gut brain access to the extent that which um, microbes living in your gut help to stimulate the production of serotonin or their metabolites entering the bloodstream or the uh, cytokines produced by your immune system detecting these organisms all have on your brain and again there is some evidence out there to say that they can even affect your mood on a day-to-day -day basis. Do have a look at this research, it's extremely exciting and uh, we'll probably talk more about it in year two as well. This is one um, piece of research I did want to go into. This was the role that the gut microbiota may have in uh, obesity. Um, so this is a study which came out in 2013 in twins and human in twins um, initially, and, and also in uh, in animal studies as well. So this is a, a kind of rundown of the experiments that were performed. So um, these were um, looking at uh, human twin children where one was obese and one was lean, and the microbiota were basically a, a sample was taken and it was injected into um, recipient mice. Now these mice are genetically identical to each other, they effectively come from the same stock. You can buy genetically identical mice kind of off the shelf. And with these two different transplantations, so essentially the same experimental condition, the same living conditions, uh, and the same diet, and also with the same opportunities for the same amount of exercise, what happened was that mice that had, been, that had received a transplant from the obese child actually gained weight, and the mouse which had received a transplant from the lean child actually stayed lean. And what was interesting is when you took the microbiota from the lean mouse and transplanted it and vice versa, the lean mouse put on weight and the obese mouse lost weight. Um, now there are people that are then looking into this as potential therapies, and in fact 
um, using microbiota to uh, treat other conditions is something that's now being thought of in in in, uh, in kind of future potential therapies. And again, we will hopefully talk about this more in year two because it is very um, uh, uh, early stage research. Now, this is a figure that I showed back in uh, infancy case unit, and this has basically been taken, uh, you know, I've just taken it out of MIMS Medical Microbiology, uh, and there's quite a lot of information going on in this slide, and I'm not expecting people to know all of these things, so don't worry about it straight away. But there are a couple of key messages to take. So, um, I mean, obviously, you can see just by looking at some of the names on the side here, there are some really important, medically important bacteria. Okay, so you've got things like E. coli, you've got things like Klebsiella, you've got things like Salmonella, and these are organisms which, in time, you will probably become a little bit more familiar with. At the very least, what you'll do is you'll be able to look at a name and say, is it a bacterium, is it a virus, is it a fungus, or whatever. In some cases, um, you'll see that some of these names are in italics. So this is uh, where we're referring to a particular species of Klebsiella. And in some cases, we're referring to where well, the organism is actually not in italics. And these are just a generic group of bacteria. So actually several species, which we call enterobacteria. Remember, enteric just means basically within the GI tract. Within this figure, it's really important just to think about, and again, this links back to the first of these narrated notes, basically the um, where we find the, the largest numbers of cells. So you, I mean, it's not terribly difficult, you know, it's a gradient from relatively low to relatively high numbers. But to some get some sort of appreciation of where you're gonna find particular bacteria. So for example, certain organisms like Clostridium, which requires anaerobic environments to grow, is only found in the large bowel. It's also worth saying, actually, that even the things we're looking at here are just bacteria, so we're not even considering viruses. There are very many important viruses that affect the GI tract, um, and there are also viruses which infect and kill bacteria within the GI tract, and their role in perhaps um, being used as a therapy is something that's being explored. Now, generally, some of these things are, or many of these things, to be honest, are harmless, and they're commensals just living on the food that we're living in. Now, some of them are um, pathogens, so for example salmonella generally is considered a bit of a pathogen, often it's found inside of us and so one should just be careful about does the presence of a pathogen inside of a patient mean that that person is going to be sick with it? Probably not, so you need to be careful when you order tests and they test positive for the presence of a particular pathogen, it may not necessarily be the thing that's causing the disease that you might be looking for. This is where knowing some of the, well, being aware of what these kind of microorganisms can do and, and looking to see whether their clinical symptoms match up is really important. Now, the other thing to say is as well, in some cases, so for something like E. coli, actually the situation is a lot more complicated. There are strains of E. coli which are um, completely harmless. They live inside of us actually making vitamin K, uh, fermenting our food, just being harmless. And there are strains which are toxin-forming, producing strains. So these are E. coli cells which have acquired genes to make virulence factors which make them a lot more pathogenic. And um, I'll introduce you to just one or two of those in a moment. But actually you'll come back to think about E. coli in the context of urinary tract infections in old age one. Another thing to think about, and this is something which um, just might help you kind of just consider the role of the microbiome in people, is to think of a donut. And I don't mean like you know, I'm quite hungry, so maybe that's why I'm showing a picture of a donut. Imagine the human body as kind of a donut. So everything is on the outside with a hole running through the middle. Now, technically, you could kind of consider the inside of your GI tract to still be on the outside of the body. So that means that the contents of all the stuff inside your GI tract have to cross some kind of barrier to get into the body. And thinking of this, particularly within your large and small bowel, actually can be quite a useful way of helping you to think about how the microbiome within your gut interacts with the body. And there are some very complex immune reactions and interactions which occur along these interfaces, which Christian will probably talk to you about in year two and year three, and indeed in year four when you go into your allergy pathway as well. This is um, a really good link to a, a video which Christian's asked me just to highlight to you. You know, you will come onto this a lot more in the latter years, particularly next year, um, when at the beginning of the year in conception, you'll be introduced to this idea of mucosal immunology. 
This is a video um, which I'll include the, the link to in the in the notes. Really great YouTube video from Nature, and it's basically a six or seven minute overview of immunology in the gut. So please take a look at it. Now in that they introduce you to a type of T cell called T regulatory cells or T regs. They'll also give you a brief overview of pious patches as well. So um, just basically going through uh, the structure of these things and the role in something called tolerance. So um, please take a look, but rest assured you'll get a lot more uh, later in your course. So I'm going to go through just a couple of mechanisms by which these pathogens actually make us sick. There are lots of different mechanisms they use. The actual, you actually start looking at the detail. It's amazingly sophisticated, some of these things that they do. And then generally speaking, every single one is different from another. But in terms of, for example, causing diarrhea, and we thinking, and we think globally, diarrhea is a huge cause of morbidity and mortality, particularly in the developing world. It's really important to think about. The first thing we're going to think about are enterotoxins. Enterotoxins are exotoxins made by bacteria that happen to be within the enteric system. Okay. Now, at the beginning of the year, we talked about the differences between endo and exotoxins. And if you're not really sure of the difference now, it's probably a good idea just to go back and refresh your memory. But remember, enterotoxin is an exotoxin, which is basically an exported toxin into the surroundings of a bacterial cell, it just happens to be within the enteric system. Let's imagine we have some cells which are being colonised by um, some enteric bacteria, and what they do is they'll usually s attach themselves via um, adhesins, so cell surface proteins, and or pili over the surface of your epithelial cells. And what they'll do is they'll inject toxins into your epithelial cells to begin to weaken them. And the reason they're doing this is because they have a little bit of a a strange problem, which is that they've attached themselves pretty well to the surface of your epithelial cells. So to dislodge them, they inject a toxin which results in water flushing out of the, the cells. Cholera toxin is quite a good example. It's referred to as sometimes referred to as a dysregulating toxin. It results in chloride ions coming out of the cell and then water flowing up outwards as well. So you get a big flow of water out of the side into the lumen of the gut. And what then happens is that when you have this big flushing action of water, then the cells are dislodged and they're then able to flow away through the GI tract. And, and people with cholera and other enteric um, bacteria that have infections with this, they are incredibly infected, um, usually via um, fecal contamination. Um, this profuse watery diarrhoea can be sometimes referred to as uh, rice water, rice stools, particularly with cholera, because it's just this completely uncontrollable um, disease. One or two of the other things that you may have heard of, so Campylobacter, really important in the UK, it's the number one cause of gastroenteritis. Most people think they have E. coli or Salmonella, it's not, it's actually Campylobacter. But Salmonella is really important, um, and again, in the, in the context of notifiable diseases, these are all really important to think about as well. Another really important uh, mode of action are, uh, is, is simply in epithelial cell death. So I'm going to give you a, a brief example here, but there are actually several different mechanisms by which this can occur. So here we have a cell uh, in the, really the example here I'm showing is dysentery, so they're engulfed by epithelial cells or they actively promote the phagocytosis. They then can spread laterally throughout the, the um, epithelial cells, resulting in cell death and then fluid leaking, um, either blood or water. And the reason they're doing this again is that that resulting blood and water can become infected. Or in the case of Shigella, which causes dysentery, um, that blood can be a growth substrate that the bacteria can, can grow on as well outside of the um, epithelial cells. So basically this is what happens. You see invasion and multiplication in your epithelial cells. It can be characterised by blood in stool, though this isn't always, and this is another segue back to the case that you're looking at at the moment. Um, and in the, in the example of dysentery that I've just kind of, sort of briefly talked about, this is formed by an organism called Shigella, um, which is a, a gram-negative close relative of Salmonella and E. coli. Um, it's worth saying that dysentery is actually, again, also important in the developing world, um, and there are some amoeba that cause dysentery as well. One class of organisms which I haven't really spoken about are the viruses, and enteroviruses are viruses obviously found just in the enteric system, and it's a broad, cap or broad group, I suppose, of, of viruses which do cause illnesses. 
and in particular, rotavirus is very, very important in the developing world, and lots of infant deaths are caused by diarrhoea formed by rotavirus. We actually do have this in this country. Remember, we get vaccinated against rotavirus. We can be vaccinated against it, though in time you also do build up immunity towards this virus by repeated infections. Okay, and lastly, um, this is the mechanism of um, destroying the brush border. So here we have on the the left hand side, this is an electron micrograph, so a very high resolution micrograph, or mic uh, basically a microscope image of the surface of epithelial cells, and you can see the brush border, so all these microvilli sticking up. And when we infect them with E. coli, um, what you see is the, the surface of the cells are just completely destroyed, and in fact the E. coli are, t are tethering themselves very closely to the, the surface of these microvilli. Here you can see one or two. Um, cells actually attach to the surface and what the E. coli does is incredibly sophisticated, it attaches itself to the surface of these microvilli and then it injects toxins and effectors into the, surf in into the cell which is sit underneath and it remodels the actin cytoskeleton of the cell to form these little pedestals. You can see here the cell is just kind of sat on a, on a small chair that's built for itself where it forms these micro colonies which are very difficult, but they can be very difficult to treat with antibiotics. And um, so the actual kind of molecular biology is really fascinating. On the bottom here, we have um, kind of uh, a, a transmission electron micrograph, so actually looking through these, these microvilli rather than just scanning the surface. On the, um, the left and the right, these are, well, on the left, these are, uh, this is an intestinal cells which have been infected by a normal like virus, which is sometimes also referred to as norovirus, or the winter vomiting bug. And what happens here is that the virus completely, again, destroys these microvilli. It m means that you're unable to absorb water, and then the, um, the, uh, the virus is able to spread via the diarrhea that forms. It's also actively growing, replicating within these epithelial cells and shedding into the um, diarrhea that it's causing, basically, in the lumen of the gut. And the last example I want to go through is Clostridium, Clostridium difficile, or C. diff. And um, this is an incredibly important uh, infection, particularly in uh, hospital environments and patients who are on antibiotics. So it's usually a consequence actually of receiving an antibiotic to treat one infection and then you get a subsequent C. diff infection. So some people consider it a bit of an opportunistic infection. Here we have an image. This image is just taken from a, a Nature Reviews uh, microbiology paper from a few years ago now. Basically, it's a pretty straightforward concept to get. So what you have is, normally, without an antibiotic, um, assuming the patient's well otherwise, they'll have a normal level of, of microflora, which will be competing and killing C. diff within the GI tract. So there's no, pretty much, risk of a Clostridium difficile infection. But what can happen is that if the patient is put on antibiotics, particularly very long courses of antibiotics, these drugs are fairly non-specific. Uh, for, the, for the bacteria that they're killing and they're likely to wipe out large numbers of the flora living inside of you and so these numbers are decreased and when that happens thinking back to the beginning of these notes those um, friendly bacteria, that's called friendly bacteria which are competing with Clostridium difficile for space get killed off and that gives an opportunity for C. diff to grow and you, as their numbers increase they produce toxins which begin to damage um, the gut and it can lead to uh, diarrhea, particularly bloody diarrhea. Now, actually, one of the there are two courses of um, action that you can take. One is to give further antibiotics to kill the C. diff infection, um, or if the patient can take it, actually take them off antibiotics. Um, that will restore the normal flora, and then they will compete with the C. diff, and your infection will go down. There are experimental therapies looking at the use of pre and probiotics to basically try and counteract this as well, so to, to try and restore this normal flora faster. If you want to read about it, um, this is uh, NEJM article from 2005, from the links in the, um, the notes at the bottom. And there we have the end of the notes. Um, if you've got any questions, then just feel free to get in touch. This is meant to be kind of a very brief overview. Um, if you have any questions, you're not sure about how much you're supposed to know or what you're supposed to know by the end of the year in terms of microbiology with the GI tract, then just get in touch. It, this is a very developing area and um, hopefully I'll get the chance to talk to you more about it in year two and beyond. See you soon.